and gentlemen, welcome to the National Constitution Center, and thank you so much for coming. I am Jeffrey Rosen. I am the president and CEO of this wonderful institution, and I'm thrilled to welcome you to what I hope and expect will be a historic series of events. This is our first Town Hall Tuesday. So where does the idea of Town Hall Tuesday come from? The National Constitution Center is the only institution in America chartered by Congress to disseminate information about the US Constitution on a nonpartisan basis. And to fulfill that noble aspiration, we have three goals. We are the Museum of We the People. Starting next year, we'll display one of the 12 original copies of the Bill of Rights. We're a center for civic education, and we aspire to have the best interactive Constitution on the web. And finally, we are America's town hall, the place where we want citizens to come, both here in Philadelphia and on the web and on radio and on TV and on podcast, to hear the best arguments on all sides of the current constitutional debates that are transfixing the country so that you can make up your own minds. And just a few uh, weeks ago, we had the idea that we wanted to inaugurate a regular series of these town hall debates every Tuesday, once a month. We picked the date, and then just last week, we asked ourselves, what is the issue that the country really is most engaged about right now, involving constitutional but not political issues? And we settled on the budget crisis, the government shutdown, and whether the president has the power to raise the debt ceiling. This is a complicated question constitutionally. We're all going to have to do some work to take out our constitutions and work <laughs> through together what the various arguments are for and against the president's unilateral, I'm, okay, you, uh, Ilya, you've got the Cato Constitution. <laughs> <laughs> I've, of course, got the National Constitution Center Constitution. In fact, I'll trade you. Mine is my special wedding uh, version oh. with my wife and my name on it uh, with oh, okay. the date that we gave out for, uh, for our guests. Okay, well, then I'll give you two National Constitution Center ones <laughs> in exchange for your wedding. <laughs> your wedding <laughs> really? Sure. <laughs> All right, good. Go. Well, and I'll raise you three if John will throw in the Princeton <laughs> Constitution. Basically, we're going to be reading uh, this document. Let me introduce... Now, you didn't amend this, because I know Cato, I can verify Cato's, but uh, oh. you didn't take out the parts you didn't like? No, we're nonpartisan here. We, we include all amendments, and uh, we believe that they're all equally, equally valid. Uh, let me introduce my colleagues. This is really a dream team of this fascinating issue, and then we will plunge right in. We've got a lot to talk about. So on my uh, right, my dear colleague from George Washington University Law School, Neil Buchanan. He is a professor of law at GW, where he teaches tax law, uh, tax policy, contracts, law, and economics. He's addressed the tax and spending patterns of the federal government, uh, the national debt, social security. He's an acclaimed teacher, a beloved colleague. We've been on the same faculty for a long time. And he really has put himself at the center of this debate by writing a series of uh, seminal papers, first an essay in the Columbia Law Review in 2011 about the president's power to raise the debt ceiling on his own, uh, where he came up with a very interesting idea that unilateral action would be the least unconstitutional option. And then he recently wrote with his colleague Mike Dorff an op-ed in the New York Times, which really defined this debate. So we're incredibly excited to have Neil here. Uh, to my immediate right is Ilya Shapiro, Senior Fellow in Constitutional Studies at the Cato Institute, Editor-in-Chief of the Cato Supreme Court Review. He has been an advisor to the multinational force in Iraq on rule of law issues. He's practiced uh, antitrust and international litigation at Patton Boggs. He has proved himself to be the most thoughtful and prolific commentator from a principled libertarian perspective, and he's been a regular contributor to the podcast series that we've started here. We've had three of them. This is the fourth in a series, and Ilya inaugurated the first with a great debate about whether uh, the Supreme Court's McCutcheon campaign finance case and whether the Supreme Court should abandon its uh, limits on uh, aggregate campaign contributions. And finally, uh, to my left is Sean Wilentz, the George Henry Davis, 1886 professor of American history at Princeton University. He is one of the nation's most acclaimed and prominent historians. He's the author of uh, spectacular books, including The Rise of American Democracy from Jefferson to Lincoln. He has been a longtime colleague of mine at the New Republic magazine, where he's been a contributing editor and where I've long served as the legal affairs editor. And Sean, always the most thoughtful, provocative, and unexpected uh, voice on the historical dimensions of constitutional issues, wrote an op-ed in the New York Times uh, also recently that completely changed the debate by arguing 
that uh, the President uh, Obama should be more like Lincoln than Buchanan, and uh, no relation uh, to Neil, uh, but uh, <laughs> uh, Buchanan, the least successful president, Lincoln the most, and should, under seizing his emergency powers, raise the debt ceiling limit on his own. Okay, so let's plunge in. We're going to start with by asking what John Bingham, the principal framer of the 14th Amendment, would have thought about the debt ceiling crisis. And then after talking about that for a bit, we'll go on to ask what would James Madison, the original framer of the Constitution and Bill of Rights have made of the budget shutdown. So for the Bingham question, we're going to begin with our text, and I now have my incredibly reliable and beautifully uh, embossed uh, Cato Constitution. And I'm going to read a section of the 14th Amendment that's not all that familiar. I teach constitutional law. I have a great uh, pleasure of doing that. And most of what I teach has to do with section one of the 14th Amendment, which, uh, remember, passed after the Civil War. Uh, in 1868, section one is the one that guarantees to all persons born or naturalized in the United States uh, uh, equal protection of the law, a right against state deprivation of due process of law. It guarantees the privileges and immunities of citizenship. That's the one we all know and teach and that is the source of all of our um, jurisprudence of equality and liberty. But we're talking about a different section here and that's section four. Uh, that before this recent crisis, no one paid much attention to. I'm going to read section four and then ask our dream team to parse it. Section four, the validity of the public debt of the United States, authorized by law, including debts incurred for payment of pensions and bounties for services in suppressing insurrection or rebellion, shall not be questioned. But neither the United States nor any state shall assume or pay any debt or obligation incurred in aid of insurrection or rebellion against the United States, or any claim of loss or emancipation of any slave, but all such debts, obligations, and claims shall be held illegal and void. Okay, that's quite a mouthful. Sean, tell us the history of that provision. What were the framers of Section 4 of the 14th Amendment thinking about when they passed that provision? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> well, it has to do with the, after the Civil War, there's a question of debt. Big war, big debt. Whose debt was going to be paid, if any? Well, the Confederates' debt was going to be repudiated. That's what the second half of the, of the uh, section does. They basically, they say all the debts run out by the Confederacy are null and void. Forget about it. You're not going to get your money. The Union debt, however, had to be, they believed, had to be declared inviolable, really, which is, which is what the, 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 um, the, uh, the um, amendment does, that section of the amendment. <clears throat> the background to it is pretty simple. After the war, there were... The, they took a while for the South to come back, took until 1868 for the South to come back. So there were, the Southerners were still out, but there were still a lot of Northerners, Northern Democrats, who had been sympathetic to the South, some of them actually actively pro-slavery. If you saw the film Lincoln, with, it brings it out quite clearly, Fernando Wood, people like that. Um, they were still around, and they were, uh, the Republicans were apprehensive. Some Republicans were apprehensive that they might do something to try and honor the Confederate debt, or and or they would use greenbacks that had been issued during the, during the war to pay back the Union debt, including the Union debt to pensioners and widows, et cetera. That's why that's all in there. Um, and they wanted to prevent that. They wanted to prevent the Democrats from you know, doing, doing, playing, playing mischief with the debt. So it was actually Benjamin Wade who did more, than, more of this than anyone else, more than Bingham, um, in the debate. Um, it kind of evolved as the debate went on. You know, the, 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 unlike unlike the, uh, the Constitution itself, it's Congress that does the framing of these amendments. And so the debate evolved, and first it, it was only about the Confederate debt, then the question of the Union debt came up and it expanded. But Wade made it very, very clear, I think. Um, I mean, it's later going to be you know, a Supreme Court case. But Wade makes it very clear that that's exactly what he wanted to do, was to prevent the U.S. debt from being played, I mean, inviolable, so that future Congresses, future majorities in Congresses, I think that's the phrase he uses in the debate, will, uh, so that the debt will not be subject to the whims of future majorities in Congress, which is about as close as you can imagine saying, you know, addressing the problem we have today. So to, so to my, you know, reading of that, which is, you know, 15 years ago, the last time we were talking about the Constitution, we, there were all kinds of questions about impeachment, parsing, that was very difficult. This, this is not so difficult for me to parse. Um, which is that any action you know, by, by Congress, President, any other official to um, um, question the debt. I mean, they don't just want to not violate the debt. They don't even want you to question the debt. Um, is unconstitutional. 
um, and hence, it's not so much the debt ceiling, but any action to, that would trip off um, a default a, 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 is, is unconstitutional. I mean, that's just sort of flat, clear. I don't think there's much debate about that. Any? I'll debate it. Okay. Um. I didn't say none. <laughs> I just said much. That's what we're here for. Our, the motto at the National Constitution Center is visit, learn, debate. Right. And Ilya, first of all, do you want to take issue with Sean's history? And then what aspect of his contemporary conclusions do you well, want Well, uh, no, to no. The, the history, I mean, he's a Princeton historian. I went to Princeton. I can't be questioning <laughs> that, that. That would mean questioning the validity of my degree. <laughs> right. Uh, no, uh, I mean, I, I, that's right. And it was the other, the other personage that, that hasn't been mentioned yet is Jacob Howard, uh, also one of the leaders in the Senate uh, of the ratification debates of the 14th Amendment. Um, you know, that's all well and good, uh, but there's still some ambiguity there. What is debt? You know, does it just mean the bonds that are issued? Does it also mean appropriations that Congress made? Does it mean entitlements now in the modern era? Uh, it's unclear. I mean, there are debates, active debates uh, uh, about this. And what does it mean to question the debt. So, for example, uh, any time, say, Congress starts spending a lot of money, well, that could endanger, in some future point, our ability to, to pay it back. Any time there's a tax increase or a cut, depending on whether you're using static or dynamic economic modeling, that could, at some future uh, uh, time, increase the probability at the margin of there being a default. So there is some question of what exact action constitutes a, an unconstitutional questioning of the debt. Right, we're not sure how broadly to interpret these words, questioning of the public debt. Now, as Sean mentioned, there's an important Supreme Court decision on point, and let me just mention it and ask Neil what he thinks the relevance is. This is the Perry decision from 1935, written by Chief Justice Charles Evans Hughes, and uh, Chief Justice Hughes says in Perry, the 14th Amendment, in its fourth section, declares the validity of the public debt shall not be questioned. While this provision was undoubtedly inspired by the desire to put beyond question the obligation of the government issued during the Civil War. Its language indicates a broader connotation, says Hughes. We regard it as confirmatory of a fundamental principle, which applies as well to the government bonds in question and to others duly authorized by the Congress as to those issued before the amendment was adopted. Nor can we perceive any reason for not considering the expression, the validity of the public debt, as embracing whatever concerns the integrity of public obligations. Um, Neil, what was going on in Perry with the gold standard in FBR, and what is the relevance of that case for our understanding of the meaning of the words public debt? Well, the, the, the broadest point that, that the Chief Justice was making there, and, and by the way, we should be clear, that is not a controlling opinion. Um, it, it was a very weird case where they, <laughs> they, they argued a, a, a several different points. They came to this very important point, and then they just sort of sidestepped it and didn't reach a conclusion. So, so th this is uh, a persuasive authority. Um, but, uh, but it is the only Supreme Court statement on this issue. Um, and so it's darn persuasive authority, in, in, in my opinion. And, and the first point that he's making is, is, is essentially that the, uh, uh, you don't read constitutional provisions uh, um, away by saying that they're, they're entirely of their historical era, right? So, uh, uh, so, so what, what that opinion was, was saying was, well, of course this, had, this was made part of the Constitution. This was not just sort of uh, uh, saying, let's pay our Civil War debts and, and be done with it. And so uh, carrying it forward into the future, the, the, uh, uh, the, the question of, as, as Ilya brought up, the question of what counts as debt and then what counts as questioning um, become the important pressure points in, in the opinion. And, 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 and let me um, make one comment about, uh, about it, uh, Ilya's point. Um, uh, before I, was, I went to law school, I was an economics professor, and so I can't stop myself from being boring every now and then. But, um, <laughs> We're interesting. <laughs> uh, well, I, I, I hope in this case. The, the, um, uh, a number of people have made this argument that um, issuing more debt is itself um, to question the validity of the debt because it increases or decreases the likelihood of a default in the future. That's actually false. I mean, just as a, as a technical matter, it, it's false because the debt of the United States is denominated in dollars that are issued by the United States. And so it, it's, it's, it's simply not true that issuing more debt makes it more likely that the federal government is going to, to default on the debt. The federal government is incapable of defaulting on the debt unless Congress does what they tried to do last week, or the Republicans in, in Congress tried, tried to do what they did last week. Now, on, on the, the what counts as debt issue, I agree with, with, with Sean's reading um, that it's very broad. I think the only way to get to a narrow reading 
gets to such a narrow reading that it, that it becomes absurd. And, and that is uh, that if you really want to define debt as debt, right, then what that, in, in this narrow sense, it's the treasury securities, right? Then what you would say is how much debt exists right now? The treasury securities can be added up, right? The, the, the total value can be added up. But that's different uh, uh, from the interest that is due on, on, on those treasury securities. The interest to be paid on the treasury securities is statutorily required in the same way that uh, uh, the other obligations of the United States are statutorily set up. So what, when Congress appropriates funds to pay uh, hospitals to reimburse for Medicare treatment, for example, or when they, uh, uh, when, when they appropriate money for uh, pensions for, for soldiers coming back from Asca Afghanistan or Iraq. These things are statutorily set to, to say, at this point in the future, the federal government obligates itself to pay. Now, if, you, it, uh, if people want to narrow the, the word debt in the 14th Amendment to just mean, uh, oh, it can't mean all those other obligations, then it also doesn't mean the interest. It only says that the one thing we won't, we won't repudiate is the principle itself. And that's not the way the people who want to read it narrowly have been, been describing it. They've been saying, well, we have to, play, to pay the principle and interest, but none of the other obligations are implicated. And again, I think Hughes had it right. How much turns on the broader narrow reading? Ilya, is it your position that debt should be read narrowly and that constrains the president's action? Or do you agree that debt should be read broadly but disagree about what the consequences of that are? Well, later in section four, there's a distinction, a textual one, between debt and obligation. It says, uh, neither the United States nor any state shall assume or pay any debt or obligation incurred in the aid of you know, the, the Confederacy, uh, but all such debts, obligations, and claims shall be held illegal. So you know, the, the framers aren't, don't use, you know, they're not like modern corporate lawyers that say the same word, uh, use 10 synonyms. Uh, just as a belt and five pairs of suspenders sort of thing. So that tells me that it's not everything. It's not, you know, every single piece of appropriate. Once Congress uh, appropriates something, uh, that's it. That cannot be questioned. A future Congress can't even repeal that or lower it because, you know, I mean, it, but, but, it, but it can't be as narrow as just the principle either. So I'm not clear. I mean, there, there's, there's an actual, I'm not being uh, disingenuous, there's an actual ambiguity there of uh, what it means. Can I trump it? There's no ambiguity at all, in fact. <laughs> um, and if you read the, the, the first half, of it, which is about the union debt, it's not only the debt. They don't parse it. They say the, the, the public debt. The public debt is the sum total of obligations that, the, that, the, that, the, that, that we have incurred. They even make the point of, explicitly, this comes out in the debates in the, in, the, um, in, the, in the Senate in particular, they even list pensioners and um, widows. So they're going outside of the question of you know, securities. They're talking about entitlements, in fact. So I, I, I see no reason whatsoever to think that, there's any, that they intended anything and that we should read it any other way than the debt being the debt. Is, is this a translation problem? After all, there was no welfare state at the time of the 14th Amendment was passed. There was no distinction between... Um, appropriations and expenditures but, but it, and so but it, forth? I, I'm going to jump in because this sort of speaks to my point. Because if, if, if there's an origin of the welfare state, it's precisely in these pensions. I mean, there's, there are entire books written about this, about how this is the, the distant origins of the kind of, 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 of federal provision um, that, that, it, that later become the welfare state. So the very fact that they singled that out, to me, obviously it's, not, it's, it's, it's a very long time ago, but it, 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 the intentions are very clear. Okay, so just, we're, we're just trying to clarify the, the various positions. Ilya, you say you're not sure, but if one were to take the narrowest reading of public debt, what would the consequences of that be, that the president has no power to act in this situation? It, it would seem that, um, that the president, if we come to a situation where there's no more uh, borrowing allowed, then the, constitutionally the president can't do anything about, it's uh, kind of a priority of what gets paid out, I guess that the principal and interest uh, on the debt, what we colloquially call the debt, would have some sort of priority, and then you figure out which other obligations rise to the level of debt or what have you, to the extent practical. It might not be practical. The, the Treasury Secretary, Jack Lew, uh, was saying that, well, the way that our software is functioning, we can't stop payment on some checks or parts of checks and, and not others. So there are some practical issues that go in there well, uh, as well up to, up to the minutiae. Uh, I'm not convinced that that's absolutely what, you know, it gives the president the right or, or directs him 
uh, to do necessarily, and I'm sorry, I'm, normally I'm very opinionated about certain things, but <laughs> this issue, as, as you were saying in the green room, it's kind of uh, confusing and points in various directions, which is why I think uh, Neil's work on this uh, trilemma uh, I think is, is a useful framework, even if I you know, disagree with what well, we can get into that or some of the ultimate conclusions. I want to ask Neil about this riveting trilemma, which is really, really very interesting in a moment. But just so I understand the various positions, President Obama has forsworn the possibility of invoking the 14th Amendment to raise the debt ceiling on his own. And he's supported in that by some conservative scholars like Michael McConnell. Is that based on the conclusion of his lawyers that debt in the 14th Amendment is defined narrowly and doesn't include all the obligations of the... Uh, I, I mean, I'm not sure. I haven't seen a legal opinion from the Office of Legal Counsel or the White House Counsel's Office or anything else. I think probably the strongest point is that the president simply cannot act unilaterally uh, to, to do these things. He doesn't have the taxing power. He doesn't have the spending power. He can't uh, decide constitutionally, legally. You know, he might be justified to act, act extra constitutionally or what have you. Neil can get into that with, uh, with the trilemma. Um, but he can't simply decide, aha, uh -huh, I need to execute these laws, I need to get money to fulfill Congress's appropriations, therefore I will simply act either because it's, you know, the, my inherent power, for whatever other reason, act unilaterally. I think if there is a constitutional obligation, there definitely is one on Congress and the President to pass a future law to amend their spending regulations or raise the debt ceiling and remove the, the barrier or uh, increase taxes or, or sell public lands. I mean, there are lots of things that are available to the government generally even if I don't think the president has uh, unilateral authority to act. Great. So your position, as you just articulated it, is that the uh, debt uh, limits cannot be breached, but that there are other options, such as Congress on its own, selling public lands or so forth that would avoid default. Neil, you were going to jump in here. You were going to both explain to us why it is that President Obama has said he does not have this power under the 14th Amendment. And then perhaps you can explain to us what is this riveting trilemma and what should the president do about it? Uh, yeah, so, so thank you for, for the, that lead-in, um, since the, the trilemma has become my life for the last two years. <laughs> um, but, but before I get to that, the, the, uh, the question was, was raised, uh, what do the people who, who reject the 14th Amendment argument seem to be saying? Um, and one of the disappointments is that nobody has actually done more than give an interview to, to yes. a, a reporter right. on this. Um, uh, as Ilya says, OLC hasn't issued an, an, any uh, guidance on it. And then, in fact, there's a freedom of information request out that, that the administration is resisting on that. There certainly have been no other law review articles um, that, that have come, come out on this. So the closest you can get is I was on a panel a year and a half ago where, where Professor McConnell uh, argued against me. And he said that the, um, the reason the 14th Amendment argument doesn't work is because it was only about repudiation. Um, and it was interesting because your, uh, Ilya's uh, 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 executive director of the Cato Institute, um, Ilya pointed us to a column that he wrote a couple of years ago, and it's Bob Levy. Bob Levy. Um, and Levy said, oh, come on, you, you, know, you can't read the word repudiate. I mean, for one thing, repudiate isn't even in the 14th Amendment. Right. Correct. Um, and you know, and, and so, so, he's, uh, so when McConnell says um, the 14th Amendment is only about repudiation, Levy's argument, which, which, which I made in, in my writing as well, um, essentially says, uh, uh, how does, uh, if you tell somebody, I owe you money, but I'm not going to pay you now, what's the difference between repudiation and default, right? You know, I'm, you're, you're, you, you owe me money today, I'm expecting money today, and if you tell me, oh, you know, maybe I'll pay it to you in the future if Congress gets around to, to fixing this debt ceiling problem, or maybe not, um, uh, then you're really just playing uh, with meaningless distinctions of words. So, um, so I don't get the repudiation distinction at all. Um, the, the, other thing, the other 14th Amendment argument that I heard McConnell make, or related argument that, that I heard him make, was that um, the, uh, even without the 14th Amendment, the president doesn't have the authority to borrow money on his own. And this is, is a, an, an interesting language issue here because it's tempting, and I bet I've done it in my own writing for sure, um, to use the language, can the president on his own power raise the debt ceiling, right? And the reason that is, I think, an incorrect way to, to characterize it is that that makes it sound like the president is legislating, right? If you believe the 14th Amendment argument, either in the form that Sean makes it or the slightly different form that I've made it with Professor Dorff, um, what you are saying is that the debt ceiling itself is an unconstitutional law, 
And so what remains is for the president to exercise the borrowing authority that Congress has otherwise given him through statute. Because the way it works is if you're not at the debt ceiling and, uh, and, and, and an appropriation comes in and there's not enough tax revenue coming in, then the law says to the president, borrow the difference. Right? If the debt ceiling stops that, then he can't borrow the difference. But if our argument on the 14th Amendment is right, the debt ceiling isn't there to stop it. So it's not the president saying, I want to raise the debt ceiling. It's the president saying, the 14th Amendment invalidates the debt ceiling. It is constitutionally void. And therefore, uh, I can go ahead and do the other things that Congress has ordered me to do. And, and that's a good lead into the trilemma argument, which won't take as long to, to explain. Um, our trilemma argument is that it's a separate constitutional argument. Even if Section 4 of the 14th Amendment weren't there or weren't properly interpreted in the way that I think it should be interpreted, what happens when the president gets to the point where the debt ceiling is reached and the last of the extraordinary measures has, has been uh, uh, carried out by the Treasury Department and he has obligations that look legal, legally binding payments that he has to make on a given day, and a certain amount of money coming into the treasury on that day, and they don't match up, right? Normally, as I said, he has the authority to borrow, right? But if the debt ceiling is there and has not been otherwise deemed uh, constitutionally invalid, then he has what we, uh, Pro Professor Dorf and I call the trilemma, which boils down to, well, what am I going to do? Congress has given me three things, spending laws, taxing laws, and, and debt limit law. They don't add up. They literally don't add up, right, just as a matter of arithmetic. So I have to choose one of the three. And I'm going to do something constitutionally invalid, right? I am going to either violate the debt ceiling law, or I'm going to collect more taxes than Congress said I'm allowed to collect, or I'm going to default on obligations that the federal government has duly enacted. And our, and our argument was go back from 1868 to the Constitution debates and say what does the president have a responsibility to do in the face of an irresponsible Congress or an irresponsible faction of Congress? One possible answer is, hey, Congress, thanks. You gave me all the power in the world. I'll just do whatever I want. All right? But our argument was that, that the, the, the founding principles um, require the president to do the most modest thing. That's why we call it the least unconstitutional. The thing that, would, that Congress could correct most easily, the thing that could be undone most easily, and the thing that would involve the least irrigation of legislative authority on the part of the president. And the reason we say that, that the debt ceiling has to go is because if you think about what the president would do if he started to, uh, uh, to pick and choose winners, on the, uh, 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 which is what prioritization means, right? You have a bunch of bills due on a given day, and what, whatever you think about whether or not interest on the debt should be prioritized or pay the Chinese government first or any of those issues, um, the one thing uh, that, that you know for sure is that if he honors the debt ceiling and doesn't collect any more in taxes than Congress has allowed, and you can see why he wouldn't try to do more than that, then he has to say, okay, I'm now a legislature of one. I have to decide of these priorities that Congress enacted, right, you know, Medicare payments, Social Security payments, uh, uh, payments for transportation, payments for the FBI, payments for the Transportation Security Administration. And they said, you know, food stamps, uh, get this amount. And there are all those legislative trade-offs. The president should not come along and say, well, okay, I'm just going to rewrite all those priorities. And if he does that, then he's arrogating the most power to himself. Whereas if he uh, 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 says the debt ceiling is the thing that has to go, and I'm not going to just raise the debt ceiling, I'm going to follow the orders that Congress sent me in the form of appropriations laws. And that's why we're saying he has, he has no good choices, but the least bad choice um, is to set aside the debt ceiling because uh, Congress's other laws are... Uh, are more important. Okay, wonderfully summarized. We now know what the trilemma is. Basically, the president has three choices. The Constitution requires him to spend what Congress has instructed him to spend, to only raise taxes that Congress has authorized him to impose, and to borrow no more than Congress authorizes. If the debt ceiling isn't raised, he'll have to violate one of those constitutional imperatives. None of those is a good option, but although he doesn't actually have the power 
to raise the debt ceiling on his own. That is the least unconstitutional option. Sean, what do you think of Neil's argument that this is the least unconstitutional uh, I, I'm sympathetic to it, but I, I think there may even be a constitutional way out of this without, violating, without having to choose which is the least bad. But to answer your other question, though, Jeff, the reasons that I've heard, and it's not been much more than op-eds and interviews and stuff, it's been too bad. But from what I've heard, they've addressed simply the question of whether the 14th Amendment on its own allows, permits, empowers the president to unilaterally raise the debt limit. And the answer to that, to me, is no. The 14th Amendment obviously does not do that. Like all of the Reconstruction Amendments, the ones that were passed after the Civil War, it gives Congress the power to... To, to enact, to, to follow, implement these things. But the president's not, not, not enlisted. And the fact that the president was Andrew Johnson may have something to do with that, but never mind. <laughs> um, um, so that's, that's what's been addressed. It's a question of whether it empowers the president to do that. And the answer to that is obviously no, but I don't think you can just stop there. I don't think that constitutionally or politically, really, you can stop right there. To me, the first question that has to be asked is whether, in fact, yes, a raising, a, the failure to raise a debt ceiling is a violation of the Constitution. If it is a violation of the Constitution, and I, I, think, it's, I, I think the other arguments are not good arguments. I think the, the only argument that makes sense, um, given the, a very strict reading of that, of that amendment, is that it is. What do you do when a Congress violates the Constitution? You can't impeach a Congress. You can impeach a president. You can't impeach a Congress. So this is, this is nothing that the framers had, you know, really thought about too much. Um, but what happened, they thought about what the president does it, and when the judici judi you know, um, judges would do it, but not, not the Congress. There's a difficulty, because they will have not just violated the Constitution, they will have violated their oath of office. Now, if that happens, the president, I think, can do, I don't think the president can do much until a default actually occurred. Or, I know, if, if, when a default occurs, the government cannot pay some of its obligations. It makes it more difficult to pay the other obligations. The longer it goes on, the worse it gets. I would think that if that occurred the con and, and, and the violation of the Constitution actually happened, then I think the president is bound by his oath of office to repair the Constitution. He has taken an oath to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. If, I mean, much as when the Confederates <laughs> did their thing, if anybody, anybody or anybody, um, takes actions which are going to harm the Constitution, he is, by the Constitution itself, because that's where the oath is, it's, it's found in the Constitution itself, he has not just the um, a, a desire, he has an obligation to take the steps that would repair it. It's a constitutional argument. It's not an economic argument. It's not an argument about debts. It's not an argument about anything else. It's strictly on the basis of what he is supposed to do as president of the United States. The question has been made then, or raised, well, what happens to those, 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 those securities, to those the treasury notes? So they, who's going to buy them? It'd be so shrouded in legality. And Well, the fact is, if he doesn't do it, there'll still be cases. Because all those people that weren't paid, they're going to be suing too. So you have a choice of, you know, <laughs> what... Who do you want to get sued by? <laughs> right. right. That's basically the choice. I don't, th I don't, I don't really think... So the lawyers always win. Yeah, well, well that's true. I, the lawyers and the banks usually always win. Um, but but the, I'm not impressed by the arguments that say that, no, that these bonds will be um, um, uh, dubious. I'm not. Um, for a number of reasons. Mainly, most of the people who have said this have not, to my knowledge, consulted with the finance ministries of Germany, of China, of Russia. That's what the NSA spying is for. <laughs> we know what they think. We know what they think. <laughs> well, actually, I have a late, a late word in from Ed Snowden tells me <laughs> that what they think is that um, what, if, if you are those ministries, or for that matter, if you're Goldman Sachs, right? And you know, the question of whether you buy these securities or not is going to depend on the, you know, the, 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 the world economy depends on this. I think that they're going to be bought. So there's the economic question, will people buy the bonds? But I want to fo focus and hon hone in on Sean's very provocative constitutional argument. He invokes Lincoln during the Civil War and basically says Obama should be like Lincoln and invoking his emergency powers issue these bonds. I should, say, I should say, I, I, kind of, I slightly corrected that wording in a piece that I wrote that night, actually, because I realized in the editing it might be misconstrued. It, it was as if he was um, you know, suspending habeas corpus or something that, like that that Lincoln did. I have, a, I have a slightly different position. 
Well, you were, you were criticized for basically invoking the Lincoln suspension of habeas corpus. And one originalist blog compared you to John Yu, basically said you were you know, <laughs> in, invoking that kind of broad executive power. What's the amended position? There's the amended position is simply this. What I meant by emergency powers is not, I, I said Lincoln, he should be, I, I, all I meant to say was that he should be strong. Mm -hmm. I didn't mean he should, he should, he should be suspending habeas <laughs> corpus or anything like it. Um, and what I meant by emergency powers is things outside of the ordinary if you have a difficult situation going on. The, 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 the correct answer, the good argument is precisely the one that I made, which is outside of, just not get these things confused. Um, we're not in a civil war, we're not in that situation. It's rather to say that, that inside the Constitution there are, I mean look, to suspend habeas corpus there are powers within the, within the Constitution that are laid out for suspending, suspending habeas corpus. The question is, is there something in the Constitution that the President can look to, right, in order to justify acting in this emergency situation? And that is his oath of office. So it's more like the argument that Bill Clinton made in 2011. He said he would invoke the 14th Amendment in a debt confrontation and uh, if the courts wanted to stop them, stop and let him. Basically, he would construe his powers broadly in the face of uncertainty. I, I don't think it's quite the same as, as, as Bill Clinton's because I, I want to, I, first of all, the question of invoke, what does invoke mean? We can parse that as well. Does it mean just citing it and saying that, you know, that, that something unconstitutional is going on here? Or does it mean invoking it as a, as a sort of hammer in order to do that? Um, I'm not sure what, what President Clinton was, was, which he was meaning by all of that. Um, but I do think that you can't, um, um, you can't willy-nilly give the president the power to do, to, to, to violate the power of the purse. We all believe in the separation of powers. I mean, it's, it's inviolable. Right, but, and, and if, I, if I can jump in, yeah. I mean, that, that's exactly why the, uh, the, the, uh, we ended up um, pushing more strongly on the trilemma argument. Not because there's anything, I mean, we actually completely agree on the 14th Amendment argument, but the, but, but the point is that by um, uh, focusing on our analysis of presidential modesty in the face of being forced into an immodest act, mm -hmm. right? What that does is it respects the congressional power of the purse. Mm -hmm. And one of the interesting things about it, I, 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 uh, one of the things that professors do is that, you know, we vet our articles in front of, 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 of other uh, audiences of professors. And um, so I was presenting this at, at the University of Kentucky Law School, or a version of, of, of this argument a, a year or so ago. And, uh, and one of the, the uh, uh, professors there um, described this as Congress's um, learned helplessness. Um, and, and what he was, was saying was that this wouldn't be an accidental abrogation, or, uh, 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 an accidental giving away of congressional power. It would actually be Congress saying, we actually don't like making the tough choices and, and the trade-offs and the compromises and all the things that are required in legislating. And so it would actually be kind of fun if we could pass appropriations laws that were like Christmas tree for everyone and then say, oh, but um, uh, while we weren't looking, the debt ceiling wasn't raised, and now it's the president who has to play Scrooge, right? And so the, 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 the idea here is, and, and, and I think that, 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 that Sean is exactly right, the power of the purse matters, but it matters that you don't even let Congress give it away even when, when, it, when it wants to, right? That's what the line item veto case was from the 1990s. The Supreme Court said Congress passed a line item veto act. Clinton um, uh, signed it, and the Supreme Court said, sorry, Congress, you can't give away your right. job. That's what the separation of powers means. Right. right, I think we're getting some clarity here. We have an argument for the least unconstitutional option. We have an argument for the president invoking his uh, powers under his uh, oath clause, and I want to ask Ilya in a moment what he thinks, but I should say we're going to talk about this, then we're going to talk about Madison. We will take your questions, but if you could um, write them down on the pieces of paper that my wonderful colleague uh, Robin Morris, the director of our town hall, is going to distribute as she walks down and uh, pass them up here. We'll, we'll take them in just a moment. So Ilya, what, what do you think? Well, I think both of these arguments, whether you like them or not, they're not constitutional ones. They're extra constitutional ones. They're pragmatic ones. Uh, as Larry Tribe says, and this makes for very interesting bedfellows, as you're already gathering, you know, John Yu and Sean Wilentz on one side, the conservative Michael McConnell and Erwin Chemerinsky, very liberal law professor, uh, on the other. Um, uh, the, the Larry Tribe says that there's no way to kind of weigh comparative unconstitutionality. 
Uh, he's uh, just wrong about he's that. He's just wrong. Yeah. <laughs> well, no. It's completely wrong. There we go. I mean, you, you can, can make very good, you, you, you can, can wait make on pragmatic argument. You can make pragmatic but, but arguments. But this isn't a matter this. of pragmatism. This is a matter of saying what are the founding principles and, 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 and uh, which presidential action would most uh, 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 egregiously violate those constitutional principles. That's not a matter, matter of, of practicality. That's a matter of, of deep constitutional commitment. And the president's oath of office is in the Constitution. It is not extra-constitutional. It is there. So, so sure, I, but I don't, if, I don't, if, I don't if see Congress, the extra-constitutionality if, ex, extra constitutionality of if, it. If Congress has appropriated money and the money simply isn't there, I mean, it, it's like Congress has uh, passed a law uh, rolling back the tides, and President Knut has to execute that now. I mean, there's a certain element of impossibility here, and that's why we're getting to these kind of, uh, I don't know if it's a constitutional crisis of sorts, but maybe the president might be justified in that circumstance to say, look, I need to act in an unconstitutional manner. My lawyers tell me I have agreed that this is the least unconstitutional manner, and let history be the judge, let me be ratified or impeached or not afterwards. But I think, you know, I would maybe as president would act differently than the president who decides that maybe we should just borrow more because that's less unconstitutional. I might say maybe we should prioritize until certain things are threatened. I, I, I don't know. I mean, uh, that, again, I think it's much more of a pragmatic sort of situation. And how you apply principles of pragmatism to the oath of office. What, what is, what is, you know, which law is stronger, the debt ceiling law or the law, you know, of some little appropriation to the National Constitution Center. Uh, you know, there's no that's way to... That's the most important law. We, that's number one. <laughs> but it's not a question of the debt ceiling law. It's a question of when you violate the debt ceiling law, and that makes all the difference. I mean, I, I don't know whether the debt ceiling law is constitutional or not. I don't really have a position on that. I suspect it's probably not. I mean, it's probably constitutional, probably okay, but violating it is, isn't. And that's the question. Is this not like Lincoln? Should all the laws but one be executed so the Union may fall? Yeah, I just think that, 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 that in, in this... I mean... <laughs> There was a war going on, right? Congress was out of session. Maryland was about to blow up. He had no, there was a question of timing, right? That was a, a special kind of emergency, a very different kind of emergency than we're facing now. Congress is, seems to be always in session, um, and until they, you know, especially when they shut things down. Um, but that's a political argument. Um, yes, which we do uh, not. I'm not, get, I'm not going to go there. Um, Nonpartisan. Non absolutely. Although with John Yu, John Yu and I can't be in the same place, but that's all right. John Yu is a friend of mine, and he's a fellow at the National Constitution. I'm sure Center. that's it's true. Honorable company. But I'm just saying we, I can't, we, we, I can't imagine us agreeing. But nevertheless, um, um, are you saying that you, sir, are no John Yu? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right. I'm saying you are. Um, um, when, what was my, what were we arguing about? We, we were asking whether it was <laughs> it was like Lincoln, and you said oh, yeah. no, this is I, different. It's different, it was different from Lincoln. War. It was different from Lincoln. I think the general proposition is just that uh, my general proposition is that presidents. I believe in strong executives. I believe in energy in the executive, um, and, and and so I was looking to an example of you know, of great strength when facing off with Congress um, that that he showed, as opposed to president, as opposed to you know Professor Buchanan. Um, um, you know, so that was the only point of, the, of, that, of, that, of that similarity. Okay, this has been good, and I think we've well mooted the question of what John Bingham would think about the president's authority to raise the debt ceiling on his own. Now let's ask what Madison would have thought. There were plenty of commentary in the face of the budget shutdown saying it was all Madison's fault or Madison would have wanted it this way. Uh, we do have some text. Uh, uh, Nick Rosencrantz of Cato, another fellow here at the Constitution Center, uh, invokes Federalist 58, and I'm just going to read one paragraph of it, and I'll let our uh, debaters take it from here. Federalist 58, Madison says, the House of Representatives cannot only refuse, but they alone can propose the supplies requisite for the support of government. They, in a word, hold the purse, that powerful instrument by which we behold in the history of the British Constitution, an infant and humble representation of the people gradually enlarging the sphere of its activity and importance, and finally reducing, as far as it seems to have wished, all the overgrown prerogatives of the other branches of government. One more sentence, which is worth uh, parsing. This power over the purse may, in fact, be regarded as the most complete and effectual weapon with which any constitution can arm the immediate representatives of the people for obtaining a redress of any grievance and for carrying into effect every just and salutary measure. Sean, you are 
an expert on the mass media tradition. I, what I, would he have thought about I, this I, shutdown? I, I don't think he would have liked this shutdown. There's another line in there where he talks about dishonorable stagnation and how that would look to the, in the eyes of the world. And uh, certainly we are, the shutdown was a matter of dishonorable stagnation. Um, I, I don't think that he envisaged any um, branch of government using um, questions of the debt in order to, for, 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 to politicize these questions, to politicize what are constitutional questions. Um, that runs throughout the Federalist. They're trying their best not to do that. Now, he didn't anticipate this particular question. We're in a different world. But I think the general idea of any faction seizing upon, I mean, you know, we all know about Madison and faction, any faction seizing upon constitutional powers in order to politicize or to, or to, to, to push their own agenda, I think would have found anathema. Yeah, yeah, is that right? Some have noted that Madison would have expected all the branches to evaluate laws on constitutional, not political grounds, and would not have liked the idea of using political disagreement to hold the government hostage. Well, I, I do think that, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, all the debates in Congress in the 19th century were about whether a given bill were constitutional, not whether it's a good idea to, you know, appropriate X dollars to, um, Grover Cleveland uh, vetoed a, 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 an appropriation of $10,000 of seeds to farmers in Texas where there was a drought, saying there's no constitutional warrant for that. I mean, all, all that sort of thing. And that, that I think, uh, ultimately is the kind of Madisonian answer. We're talking about the Madisonian dilemma. This is the Madisonian uh, answer to the trilemma, perhaps, that if the government weren't engaged in so many unconstitutional things, perhaps that's an answer for what the, how the president should prioritize as well, what he thinks, you know, well, that, that program is unconstitutional, so I don't have to fund it or, or something like that. And, you know, the libertarian position at, at base from first principles uh, is that if government weren't growing beyond its constitutional bounds, we wouldn't be uh, needing to, to, to borrow this much money in the first place. Well, if, 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 if there's spending that is un unconstitutional on its own terms, you don't need a trilemma to get there. And, you know, if, if you want to have a constitutional challenge to the Social Security system, as a violation of, of some sort of core libertarian principles that, that, that some people see that I don't, um, uh, buried in the Constitution, then go ahead and do that. But, but, but the, the idea um, that, that, that you would only uh, uh, invoke those when you're in a trilemma um, seems a little strange to me. I, I do think that the, the, the Madisonian question is an interesting one because there's a huge difference between the debt ceiling question and the shutdown question. Mm. Right, because the shutdown question, I, I mean, it turned out as a numerical matter, it was less important than we thought when we, when we come, came up upon the shutdown, because so much of the appropriations are permanent appropriations, like social security payments and, and uh, uh, essential personnel and, 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 and those types of things, you know, the military. Um, but the, uh, 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 the fundamental idea behind the trilemma assumes that there are spending laws that the president has to execute, right? And if Congress simply doesn't pass spending laws, then not only do you not have a government, you can't have a trilemma either. Um, and so the, the, uh, uh, the, the sort of fundamental uh, problem on the, the, that led to the shutdown is in some ways, I mean, I, it's really worrisome. I, I don't mean that as a practical matter, it, it's very worrisome. But as a constitutional matter, it's quite different because this is a matter of, of different people drawing lines in the sand. Right? You know, I mean, think about like if, you're, if, you, if you want to buy a house and you see a house and, it, and it's being sold for $150,000. This wouldn't be in Philadelphia. Um, and, and, you know, the asking price is $150 and you offer $120. And, you know, you do your negotiation thing. You can get to the point where a deal won't go through. It just won't because their bottom line was 140 and your top line was 135. And if nobody budges, nobody budges, right? That's in, in, in a fundamental way what a shutdown boils down to. The, yeah. you know, the Republicans said, we want you to give on this, this, and this, right? You know, defund Obamacare, all that kind of thing. Obama said, you know, that, that's my bright line. I'm not going to defund o Obamacare. And, and the de Democrats stood behind him. So in some sense, as a constitutional matter, um, the power of the purse involves the power to uh, uh, reach a deadlock and simply not have a deal. But I think Sean, uh, Sean's argument is an important one because what it says is that if, if you're going to negotiate over things that are important to you, they at least have to be sort of in, uh, on the field of play. And, and um, putting the president in a trilemma is not one of the things that should be on the field of play because what that does is, it, you know, as, as, as I said, you know, puts him in an impossible situation. 
But, but even more than that, um, you have to sort of allow the field of, of play to continue to exist. Right. Right? And, and I think that, that that's the, the, the sort of bigger point that, that, that is a, a, a deeper constitutional issue that, that both sides um, in, in a budget negotiation have a responsibility to not shut down the government because they have the responsibility to not stop at 135 and 140 and refuse to, to, to meet somewhere in the middle. There's a wonderful line of, of Justice Jackson's which is that this Constitution of the United States is not a suicide pact. And on that score, I want to ask these excellent questions in a moment, but Sean, you've written about the evolution of political parties. Mm -hmm. You've said Madison was suspicious of factions. Mm -hmm. Did the founders anticipate that parties, to the degree that they existed, would compromise? And is the failure to compromise now? Well, the, 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 yeah, the, the framers on the parties are, are difficult, because they were, you know, here's, here's Madison, who disliked faction, disliked parties becoming you know, the founder or co-founder of the oldest political party in the world. So there is this, it depends on what you think a faction is. If you think Hamilton's the faction, then you're gonna go for parties. So, so it would be different. Um, so they, they would have had a very immature idea of, of what uh, compromise between parties would have been about. I don't think, you can't go back to the framers and the founders for everything. And anything about parties is one of those things. And of course, Madison also, failed to foresee if there's parties, not that they'd be deadlocked, but that they'd log roll and give each other this more of what, you know, scratch each other's back and, and all the rest of it. All of it, all of it, yeah. That's right. Uh, here's an excellent question involving my favorite founder in uh, Founders Hall. Uh, what does the panel think of a natural law, law of nations obligation to keep our promises? Does higher law come into play? James Wilson, one of the most prominent framers, repeatedly spoke of natural law obligation to keep our promises. Wilson also advocated for a strong president. And of course, it was he who conceived that we, the people of the United States as a whole, rather than we, the people of each of the sovereign states, constituted the ultimate sovereign authority under the US Constitution. So all honor to James Wilson. And what would he have thought of whether natural law? I have law a bobblehead of James Wilson put out by the green bag. I'll, I'll trade you my <laughs> for, your, for your Wilson. Or maybe Stevens plus Jackson. We'll, we'll have to negotiate out back. Okay. Maybe, maybe <laughs> Professor. And you can have Buchanan a constitution back as well. Yeah. Uh, what, what, you know, what, what about a natural law argument? Um, obligation I mean, I'm a simple constitutional lawyer. Uh, you're going to have to talk to a theologian or a philosopher or something. But you know, I believe debt should be paid uh, you know, as, a, as, a, as a, a practical, as much as a philosophical or, or a moral matter. But again, what is debt? Um, you know, I, I don't, you know, I mean, that, that, that gets into such metaphysical questions. It's, it's like if, if men were angels who had debt sort of thing. Uh. <laughs> well, I, I, I'm, I'm not much of a, a fan of, of sort of natural law-based arguments because I think that, that, that they, they can prove anything or prove too much. But, but I do think, I mean, the, the sort of fundamental idea that, that there is uh, an importance to anybody, but especially a national government, honoring its obligations. Um, uh, it, it is what, what, what motivates my analysis. And it actually comes back to that sort of practical question that we talked about earlier in terms of whether or not the um, president could issue debt in excess of the debt ceiling, either because of the 14th Amendment or because of the trilemma. And I, I, I write a bi-weekly column on a, a website called Verdict. Um, I encourage you all to read. Um, but the, uh, the, the article I wrote last week, um, I argued, you know, essentially a moral argument, which, which boils down to this. Um, the, if if the, the president actually had been put in, the, in a trilemma, um, he would have a choice of either stiffing people who had every moral belief and every uh, 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 realistic belief that the federal government owed them money, right? These are legally binding commitments by the federal government. And the president has the opportunity to meet those obligations by borrowing money from people who can go into it with their eyes wide open. Right? If, you know, like Sean was saying, you know, maybe, there, maybe there wouldn't be that much question over the, uh, these, these uh, new uh, uh, you know, questionable bonds. But let's say they're highly questionable. Right? You're still uh, 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 going to get the money from people who volunteer to take the risk. Right? And so what, the, what they're saying is, okay, I know that you know, if I buy a junk bond, sometimes junk bonds don't pay back, but that's why they pay higher interest rates. I have a diversified portfolio. One of the things that I can do is say, I think I am willing to, to lend the federal government money under these, these um, situations 
uh, uh, depending on, on what the, the market price is. And then if those people get stiffed, then they went into it knowing that that was a possibility. And, and, and to me, you know, call it natural law or, or just call it um, plain old morality, I'd rather uh, have people take risks knowingly than, uh, than have losses imposed on them because of, of congressional game playing. Uh, but, but Congress can repeal uh, an appropriation from year to year. You know, the National Constitution says. But that's going forward, right? This right. is saying, uh, it, uh, today is the day. I'm a hospital administrator. Um, I was supposed to receive reimbursement for treating a veteran, right? Which, you know, which, which I've already done, and I've already paid the doctors and the technicians. Right. And the money is supposed to come in today. Now, it's different if, if Congress says, uh, well, we are not going to appropriate money in the future so that. Uh, I, the administrator, can say, all right, well, I'm sorry, I can't provide the level of care that I otherwise would have, but it's still sure. prospective. Sure, but, or the Congress could say, we repeal Social Security, so everything that, you know, right. everyone expects. Right, prospectively. Prospectively, sure. Right. I mean, it's but, important to make the, the clarification that always has to be made, that the debt ceiling is not about a limit on future spending. The debt ceiling has to do with paying for things that you've already spent the money on the obligations already made. That often gets confused in people's minds, and I want to make sure that everybody is clear about that. I'm going to ask one more question, then I'm going to have each of our panelists sum up their position, and then we're going to take a vote. Um, the, the last uh, question is, one, uh, does the president, and I think this is for Ilya, have a fourth alternative, reduce the operating expenses of government or sell off federal assets to avoid exceeding the debt limit? Um, or printing more money. I think it's uh, perhaps there, there are more than, than one, uh, more than three uh, lemmas, as it were. Um, uh, I, I don't think that, you know, that means that the one is, again, less unconstitutional than another. I think they're all pretty much extra constitutional and for various reasons, whether you're trying to interpret what fulfills your oath better, what, you know, pragmatically, policy-wise, what is feasible. Um, you know, there could be uh, various considerations, but I think uh, any solution at that point does become extra constitutional, like uh, Lincoln's suspension of, of habeas corpus. Yeah, I, I would just add that doesn't actually add, add any lemmas. Um, what, it, what it does is, is to say <laughs> that, I, I mean, what you're describing is extraordinary measures, right? In other words, does the president have the power to do other things like selling off assets, right? In some cases he does, in some cases he doesn't. When we formally hit the debt ceiling and then several months go by before we really hit the debt ceiling, that's exactly what Treasury is doing. Right? And then in terms of, of, of uh, Ilya met, uh, mentioned um, printing money, um, that is done by having the Federal Reserve buy U.S. Treasury bonds from the, the United States Treasury, which means issuing more bonds, which is exactly what I'm saying, saying they would need to do. So you could sell it to the public right? and, and those sort of savvy investors who, who decide how much risk to take, or you can have the Federal Reserve do it. But either way you do it, you are uh, exceeding the debt ceiling. Sean, yeah. final thought? I just think that in the end, we're, we're, we talk a lot about money, we talk a lot about debt. We're, we're, this is a constitutional crisis we're in. And I think we have to realize that we're there, and we're going to be there for a while. It's, it hasn't ended. And um, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to try to evade anything. My, my views on all of this are pretty clear. But I think that we do have to take this seriously. This is really an appeal to you, you all out there. That this is not uh, simply a, a, a battle between political parties. It's, it, it has become a, a, a constitutional crisis, and we're there now. And that's why these conversations are so important and why we have to take you know, the, these, these questions very, very seriously. And I'm happy you're all here to do that, but I think we have to continue. Well, these conversations are important, and I think that this has been a wonderful one. It's a very complicated topic. This has been mooted with sophistication and subtlety. The three of you have not disagreed in a crossfire sense, but I do want to vote because it's helpful in America's town hall to take the pulse of the crowd on important constitutional questions. So recognizing that I may not be the, these positions don't exactly track those of our three panelists. Here are the three positions I'm going to ask you to vote on. Do you believe that the president has total power to raise the debt ceiling uh, by invoking emergency powers or his oath of office? Second, do you believe he has absolutely no power to take action without Congress? Or third, do you believe that he may not have the power, but it would be the least unconstitutional option to raise the debt ceiling? Those are the three options. Who supports the first position that the president has total power to raise the debt ceiling on his own? Who supports the second position that he has no power to act without congressional authorization? And who supports the third that acting would be unconstitutional but the least unconstitutional option? A victory for Professor Buchanan. Ladies and gentlemen, bravo. Very well argued and well voted. 
Uh, I'm thrilled by the debut of this series, which is going to be the centerpiece of our constitutional conversations. I want to plug our next Town Hall Tuesday on November 19th, which is actually the 150th anniversary of the Gettysburg Address, and we're going to have an extraordinarily vivid and rich program then. We have some exciting programs coming up connected to the JFK anniversary, including Phil Sheenan's important new book on November 18th, and I will be interviewing Robert Dalek about his new JFK book on November 6th. You are so, um, I'm so thankful to you, ladies and gentlemen, for taking the time on a Tuesday afternoon to come to the Constitution Center so that we can together, face to face, debate these complicated but crucial questions. By doing so, you've exercised a privilege of citizenship. I'm grateful to you. For those of you who aren't members, please join so you can continue to exercise this privilege of citizenship and hear about our programs. And for those of you who are listening on video and on podcast, please join us again next week for our next constitutional conversation. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking our panelists. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.